Sports TV. At the start of the 90s, TV news goes tabloid. And that's when John Bobbitt discovered his penis had been severed. Sex scandals, gruesome murders. They saw themselves as kind of like pirates and raiders. We changed the whole fabric of network news. Rules are rewritten. Check book journalism. They're paying for interviews. We were all paying. And that's when you struck your deal with the current affair. Yes. Reporters go rogue. You have posed me. No one was more despised than Steve Dunleavy. Just spell my name right. The public sees a chance to cash in. I was offered a lot of money to do things. Yes, I took the money. You're being accused of being a pimp. That <laughs> camera's off. <laughs> and television news will never be the same. We'll do it live. <laughs> Good evening. For decades, the nightly news in America is a serious affair. President Reagan's the White House releases key documents in the Persian Gulf today. But in the 90s, it becomes a current affair. Cops say that instead of preaching the gospel, he was throwing panty parties. And Beginning with a current affair, so-called serious news gives way to a new kind of television journalism. Get out of my face. And the story that will become a watershed moment in this transformation centers on a violent love triangle happening on Long Island, New York. Watching the Buttafucos has become something of a public Joey spectacle. Buttafuco. Joey Buttafuco. Joey Buttafuco. Joey Buttafuco. Joey Buttafuco. Joey Buttafuco. Mary Jo says she and her husband are more recognized than Charles and Di. For this housewife, tabloid news will turn her personal tragedy into a national spectacle. It was just a normal, regular, every single day of my life type of a day. I married Joe Buttafuoco, and in May of 1992, I became the fodder for tabloid TV for years and years. I was going to work on my backyard. I wanted to paint this bench, and the doorbell rang. I see a kid, a teenager, stand there, and she said, are you Mrs. Buttafuoco? I said, yes. And she said, I need to tell you that your husband is having an affair. What happens next will turn Mary Jo, her husband, and a young woman nicknamed the Long Island Lolita into household names. But the story of how America's news goes from bookish to Botafuco begins with another familiar name, Rupert Murdoch. Back in the 80s, Murdoch's tabloid newspapers are filled with stories just as juicy and tantalizing as Mary Jo's. Murdoch inherited a paper called Adelaide News in Australia from his father. And then from there, he starts to become extremely successful turning papers into tabloids. I'm Reese Peck. I'm the author of Fox Populism. I'm a professor at the College of Staten Island. One of the keys to Murdoch's success was his introduction of the Page Three Girls nude models. These tactics help Murdoch build a tabloid empire in Australia and the UK. Then he has his sights set on America. Murdoch buys the New York Post for $30 million and quickly transforms it into his kind of newspaper. Of course, it played on all the, the classic tabloid themes, you know, gruesome murders, sex scandals, bizarre events like UFOs. I think the all-time tabloid headline is the New York Post's headless body in a topless bar. Because that blends sex with murder in this punchy, punny, uh, five-word statement. Murdoch's approach to journalism is to publish what sells. Glossy pictures, big print, and stories about sex and violence. But for him, newspapers are not enough. Today, confirmation of the largest single broadcast station transaction in history. It's part of an even... Murdoch decides to do something that has never been done before. Inject his tabloid newspaper sensibility into a TV news show. The deal calls for Murdoch to pay some $2 billion for all seven Metro Media television... Now, you take the network news at the time, legitimate, you know, mainstream network local news scene. Everybody had to cover the same 
stories. If you had ideas, if you wanted to be creative, if you wanted to approach a story from a different direction, you couldn't. I'm Burt Kearns. I spent the greater part of the 1990s as a tabloid television producer, and I wrote a book called Tabloid Baby. When Rupert Murdoch started his television news operation, he didn't bring in network people from America. He brought in newspaper people from Australia. Murdoch took the best that he had and said, well, well, mate, now I'm starting television. Uh, do your thing with television. They had a very different philosophy of journalism or outlook, right? They, they looked at um, the American news scene as very austere, very boring, very drab. And they saw themselves as kind of like pirates and raiders. You know, they brag about that. Like they, they're going to conquer a, a news market. The captain of Rupert Murdoch's pirate invasion is Peter Brennan, a brash producer born in Australia. Brennan will become known as the godfather of American tabloid TV. God is the perfect word for him. I'm Jeremy Lewerce, and I was a producer for Inside Edition in the early 90s. No doubt about it, Peter Brennan is the God, he's the Messiah. He is the guy that started the genre. Murdoch immediately hires Peter Brennan, uh, another Australian, to produce, and they recruit a, a news anchor called Mari Povich. Maury was the anchor man at WTTG in Washington and married to Connie Chung, who would eventually go on to anchor the CBS Nightly News. I wasn't your traditional anchor reporter. I was never satisfied with minute and a half stories. I didn't have a great reputation of being a cookie cutter anchor man. And that makes Maury a key ingredient in the show Rupert Murdoch and Peter Brennan are cooking up. An ex-porn palace turns into a house of prayer, and the community, instead of being relieved, is angry. I definitely believe this is a cult. A Current Affair debuts in New York City in the summer of 1986. It was an immediate ratings hit. The famous A Current Affair graphic where the pyramid comes in and they hear the ka-chung, that was uh, breaking the mold. Some experts are convinced that this is truly a home to demons. But is it? We'll take in our own exorcist tonight. It became, if you want to call it, lightning in a jar or a perfect storm. We were off on a ride that I'll never forget. This bloody Hollywood murder scene. The show right? tells stories that network news dismiss as tabloid rubbish. In the life and death of adult movie super stud John Holmes. Peter had this great vision that all these stories that regular newscasts were putting in the trash can were stories that our viewers would want to see. Those classic Shakespearean themes of conflict and lust and drama. While a current affair is recorded in a New York City TV studio, the stories that make it on the air are decided in a bar across the street. It's called the Racing Club. And uh, you have to understand uh, the Australians they can drink beer from dawn to dusk. I mean, a lot of the times uh, we would be across the street uh, early in the day and Peter would get out his pen and start writing down the lineup of the show. And my wife used to say all the time, Mari, you cannot keep up with these people. I said, why? He says, well, you would come home around 8, 8.30 every night and you were trying to open up a cabinet and you, you, missed, the, you, you missed the handle three times. <laughs> I said, well, you're right. Whoever had killed her had left her cruelly exposed. She was found naked from the waist down. A current affair quickly gains a reputation for being able to break news stories, especially when those stories are rife with sex and violence. The biggest early on story was the preppy murder story in early 1987 with Robert Chambers. He had rough sex with this girl in Central Park and she died. We owned that story. Things just weren't supposed to end that way. Not for Jennifer Levin, not for Robert Chambers. The crowning jewel of that story was one of our reporters, Rafael Abramovitz, had come across a tape that Robert Chambers had made right before his trial started. And you saw the video of Robert Chambers tearing off the head of a doll. 
Oops. Stop! <laughs> I think I killed it. And a current affair ran that tape. As soon as that story came out, the ratings were huge. Rupert immediately syndicated a current affair throughout the country. Current affair took lessons from Australia and taught them to America. They knew how it worked. I don't think America knew how tabloid TV worked. They definitely broke from the news culture in the U.S., which was much more grounded on these kind of professional values of journalism. Sometime around four in the morning, they left Dorian's and made their way into Central Park. And some Along with telling stories ignored by traditional TV news, a current affair doesn't look or sound like those other shows. It incorporates music, sound effects, and actors. Things that the mainstream news networks consider off-limits. They did reenactments. I don't think you would ever see the network news at that time doing reenactments. But what really distinguishes a current affair is the performance of its host, Maury Povich. We'll be talking live to the irrepressible Zsa Zsa Gabor, who, as you saw, has just taken, rather married, her eighth husband. <laughs> Unlike network anchors, Maury personally engages in every story. If you've watched The Current Affair for any length of time, you know I hate, I can't stand UFO stories. I mean, I can't stand them. A lot of anchor people, network anchor people, local anchor, they would introduce a story and... Um, Joe Smith has a report from Dallas, and they would, and you would drop your head all of a sudden. Well, why the hell would anchor people drop their head as they introduce the story? Why don't you look at the people? Why don't you look at the audience for crying out loud? Tabloid papers are known for their visceral language in writing, right? And so the way you translate that in a TV news program is to have the host be much more emotionally expressive. And one thing about Mari Povich, you know, he was known to have the most expressive eyebrows in the industry. A physical training program for cadets so tough, they call it aerobic death. Maury's honest expressiveness is shocking to news traditionalists, while being refreshing to a new generation of viewers. Another major date. He's a complete departure from the voice of God type anchors who dominate the network news. Maury changed what a television host could be. For three years, A Current Affair is the only tabloid news alternative on TV. And this is why A Current Affair is so important, because it stands as Murdoch's first successful attempt to apply this kind of British tabloid style of the newsstand in print that he was a master of to the, the realm of television, to the medium of television, which is so important, again, to American culture. Riding on that success, Two new tabloid shows hit the airwaves. Tonight on Hard Copy. Just in time for the first big sex scandal of the 90s. The rape trial of William Kennedy Smith begins tomorrow. And as you can imagine, Palm Beach is going crazy. Guts TV, a current affair with Maury Povich. At the start of the decade, a current affair is not just changing the way news is gathered and reported on TV, but what's considered news in the first place. This is a show that does stories about ordinary people who are placed in extraordinary circumstances. When it comes to turning ordinary people into extraordinary spectacles, no one quite compares to a current affairs legendary reporter, Steve Dunleavy. Steve Dunleavy was the ultimate tabloid reporter. He was known as Rupert Murdoch's alter ego. He had a pompadour, bespoke pinstripe suits, and he was hated and despised by all of his competition as this low-life reporter who would do anything for a story, but beloved by anyone who worked with him. You have to understand, Steve Dunleavy was the kind of reporter that when he was 16 years old reporting in Australia, his father, who worked at a, a rival paper, was able to get some information before Steve got it. Steve went outside and punctured the tires of his father's car so his father wouldn't get to his paper before Steve got to his. Steve Dunleavy. As a former print reporter for Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, Dunleavy knows how to deliver the sensationalism viewers crave. And he's instrumental in making A Current Affair the most watched news program on TV. Into 1990, Current Affair's ratings were going through the roof. 
All of a sudden, we got bigger and bigger and bigger. Two copycat programs are now cashing in on the tabloid market. Hello, I'm David Frost. Welcome to the first edition of Inside Edition. The more respectable Inside Edition and hard copy. The women who pay for gigolos say they're worth every penny of it. Hard copy was the dirtiest. It was, it was, it was fairly dirty. Current affair, not as dirty, and inside was a little cleaner. As the competition among tabloid TV heats up, a current affair loses some of its brightest stars. Maury leaves to pursue a career in daytime talk. Brian, you are not <laughs> Then the godfather of tabloid TV, Peter Brennan, along with Burt Kearns, go to work for hard copy. Steve Dunleavy remains at a current affair just as a huge scandal ignites in April of 1991. I'm sitting in my office at hard copy and I get a call from a stringer, a news stringer down in Florida. He said, Burt, I can't talk, but there's been a rape at the Kennedy Mansion in Palm Beach and word is that the senator's involved. Click. William Kennedy Smith, the nephew of JFK, RFK, and Ted Kennedy, is accused of raping a woman at the family mansion in Palm Beach, Florida. William Kennedy Smith. Hard copy is first to break the story, angering one of its competitors. Steve Dunleavy was going nuts because he knew what a story this was. Dunleavy goes to work. As the exploding scandal goes into day seven, report the alleged victim said, the bastard raped me. Dunleavy beats out hard copy by hunting down Michelle Cassone, a woman claiming to have witnessed Ted Kennedy exposing himself at the mansion on the same night as the alleged rape. Armed with explicit photos of Cassone, Dunleavy invites her to New York for an interview where he plans to use the pictures to discredit her. She came to New York. He brought her to the 21 Club. They had lunch. They had a liquid lunch. They drank, and he, they drank some more. And he got her drunk. And then he brought her up to the current affair offices, and they went into a conference room where they had two cameras waiting. You wouldn't pose nude for anyone? I would not pose nude for anybody. That's not my character. Let me show you something. You have posed nude. Where did you ever... <gasps> She was a woman who was saying that Senator Ted, Ted Kennedy was walking around semi-naked. She should be confronted with her lie. I showed her pictures of her being nude. In fact, pictures of her doing a little bit more than just being nude. Ooh, Michelle. Dunleavy's report raises doubts about Cassone in the public eye. Turn the cameras off. <laughs> More important for Dunleavy's career, the interview fuels ratings when Cassone attacks him mid-interview. Out! And for those of you who've been calling to ask, Steve's finger is healing nicely. The rules then were different. I don't think Steve Dunleavy could get away with some of the things that he did then now. <laughs> for the privilege of being humiliated on national TV, Cassone has paid $1,000 by a current affair. But that she got paid at all generates criticism from traditional TV news outlets. Checkbook journalism. They're paying for interviews. People couldn't believe that we were paying for interviews. And when that happened, that's how you became a true tabloid show. Of course, we got criticized from uh, all the media critics that we were paying for news and things like 60 Minutes was paying for news. They were all paying for news. They would say, oh, no, we didn't pay. The entertainment division paid. We didn't pay. Not the news division. The entertainment division paid. We were all paying, you know. But because we were tabloid, you know, we were, we were the poster child. Trading cash for an exclusive interview soon becomes more than just a question of journalistic ethics. Witnesses in high-profile court cases begin having their credibility attacked for getting paid to first tell their story on TV, including at the trial of William Kennedy Smith. Monday. And that's when you struck your deal with the current affair, isn't that correct? Yes. Isn't it a fact, uh, Ms. Mercer, that this whole program 
was created just to embarrass the Kennedy family. Steve found the main witness in the case, a woman named Ann Mercer, who had driven the victim home after the rape. Current Affair paid her $40,000 to tell her story. I turned to him and I said, oh, you look like you're having a good time. And well, he didn't reply that was great for ratings for Current Affair. But when it came time for the trial, Ann Mercer's testimony was stricken because she had been paid $40,000 for a current affair. And when William Kennedy Smith was acquitted, his attorney at the news conference thanked Steve Dunleavy for getting his client off. See you guys later. Kassong's $1,000 or even Mercer's $40,000 will soon seem almost quaint when compared to what a current affair will spend turning Mary Jo Botafuco into a media spectacle. I never, ever, ever in my wildest dreams could imagine that I would now become the focus of the tabloids. I never wanted to be famous. I never wanted to be infamous. But that's exactly what happens when a teenage girl shows up at her door, claiming to be sleeping with Mary Jo's husband. What? What? I said, look, I'll, I'll let Joe know that you came by. I turned my head and to open my door. And that's when my head exploded. The first thing I remember when I first was coming to was a nurse was standing right over my face. Mary Jo, Mary Jo, you're at the Nassau County Medical Center. You've been shot. We're going to take care of you. And I'm like, Hearing this, I've got tubes in me, I can't talk, I don't know. I didn't know it at the time, but right then and there, that life that I had was done, gone. Come on, guys, so give me a little room here, huh? Before tabloid TV, Mary Jo's story may have only made the local newspaper. Now, it's being broadcast around the world. Mary Jo made a miraculous recovery Wednesday and provided police with information about the shooting. The perpetrator, Amy Fisher, who shot Mary Jo Butterfuco in the head after she developed a near-fatal attraction for her husband, Joey Butterfuco. Mary Jo, who still had a bullet in her head, would not believe that her husband had an affair. Along with Amy Fisher, only they know what really triggered the shooting. The story with its oblivious wife, sleazy husband, an attractive teenage seductress is blood in the water for the sharks on tabloid shows, who quickly dub Amy the Long Island Lolita. All of a sudden, the news trucks start showing up, and the vans, and the reporters, and the, and the looky-loos. And with the tabloid shows parked out front, checkbooks at the ready, Mary Jo eventually names her price. Yes, I was offered a lot of money to do things. And yes, I took the money. In the quest for ratings, the three tabloid TV shows of the early 90s are locked in fierce competition. From Grace, the end of Jimmy Swigert. I have sinned against you, my Lord. New questions about Michael Jackson's drug treatment. This morning, with sex scandals and celebrity gossip leading their nightly news lineups. Hugh Grant was seen picking up a known prostitute. A current affairs star reporter, Steve Dunleavy, has built a reputation for doing anything to outscoop his rivals and becomes a key weapon in the tabloid wars. Soon, his old friends at Hard Copy, Burt Kearns and Peter Brennan, will learn for themselves how far Dunleavy will go to win. October 1991, the big story out of Hollywood was that Elizabeth Taylor was marrying Larry Fortensky at Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. It's just 24 hours before Elizabeth Taylor walks down the aisle once again. It was occurring on a Saturday. On Friday morning, I'm at my desk around 11.30. Uh, Brennan knocks on the door. Hey, Doug Levy's in town. Come on, we're going to meet him for lunch. Kearns and Brennan meet Dunleavy at a Los Angeles eatery for drinks, where Dunleavy starts complaining about work. He said, oh, man, this is terrible. You know, I, I really, I wanted to cover this Liz Taylor story, but they're not making a big deal out of it, a current affair. These people don't know what a story is. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, this is just terrible. So we continue to uh, drink. And about 8 o'clock, we had been drinking for about 8 hours. 
Steve said, look, I'm not feeling very well. I've, I've got to head back to my hotel. And we continued to drink uh, through the evening. The next morning, tired and hungover, the two aren't in top form to cover Elizabeth Taylor's wedding, just as Dunleavy had planned. All the media was at, at the gates to the Neverland Ranch. We had a, a producer there. We didn't have a reporter. And then on Monday, we, of course, were sitting there and we wanted to see what a current affair had. And the show opens with Steve Dunleavy hanging out of a helicopter over the Neverland Ranch covering the Liz Taylor wedding. I don't know whether you can see that right now, but that appears to be Liz Taylor in the yellow dress. She's approaching the gazebo, and that is where the ceremony will take place. Our old pal came to Los Angeles from New York to get us drunk and neutralize us so he could get the scoop and beat us on the story. All's fair and love war and news gathering. And that will certainly prove true as the tabloids battle over the story of the Long Island Lolita, Amy Fisher, shooting Mary Jo Botafuco in the head. Hard copy was covering this story on a daily basis throughout the month of May. Then we get word that a current affair has scooped us unbelievably. A current affair purchases a tape of what is purportedly Amy Fisher in an act of prostitution. Take care of business, and we don't worry about business, and we take care of pleasure. To promote their exclusive sex tape, a current affair teases the upcoming segment by leaking images to the tabloid newspapers the day before the show is to air. But by announcing the story early, a current affair opens the door for hard copy to play some hard ball. The light went off over Peter Brennan's head and he kind of had the idea. Syndicated shows at the time would record their shows earlier in the day and then feed it out over the satellite to the, to the affiliates around the country so we just directed our control room to steal the satellite feed from a current affair. We took our 10 seconds or whatever they allowed us to use, the lawyers allowed us to use, and then we hired a couple of actors, got them onto a bed, and we recreated it in black and white fuzzy video. So we had a package that included a bit of the sex tape, a bit of the, the still photos, and the newspapers, which we shook and moved in front of the camera so it looked like it was video, and our reenactment, and we said, tonight, exclusive. The Amy Fisher sex tape. Because hard copy airs a half hour earlier than a current affair, they managed to steal the exclusive. There was bedlam. It made headlines that hard copy had committed an act of piracy unseen in the history of television, stealing a satellite signal. They were calling me from a current affair saying, you're dead, your, your career is over. The executive producer started screaming and running around in a circle. Somebody was punching holes in the wall. And in the back, standing against the wall, they tell us, was Steve Dunleavy, just nodding, saying, touche. The original sex tape was reportedly sold to a current affair for over $10,000. And soon, nearly everyone in the Amy Fisher Botafuco circle will try and cash in by selling stories. I really had no time to recover because of the media. We were a cash cow. We even had one of my housekeepers who was not working for us at the time I got shot. She went on Donahue and lied and said Joey chased her all around the house. And I got furious because he ne she never met him. He was at work. He never, people were doing that. People, people were coming out of the woodwork and telling stories and there was no verification. The old saying, you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And I think too often this checkbook journalism breeds a type of news that's based on rumors and not necessarily facts. Because if someone's incentivized to give you something so juicy, it's such a great story, it possibly it's not true. <laughs> Nervous parents remain silent as they arrive to hear the fate of their teenage daughter, Amy Fisher. The tabloid coverage of their story is relentless, and it seems like everyone is watching, including the judge in Fisher's criminal trial, who sets the teenager's bail at $2 million, persuaded by speculation on tabloid TV that she's a flight risk. 
if production companies put up the money for this in some way. Now, I specifically asked her yesterday. Fisher isn't the only one fielding offers to make a deal with the devil in the city of angels. I started getting letters, and they were letters back then, not emails, from production companies. If I do this, I get to tell my side of the story, because up to now it's been Joey and Amy, Joey and Amy, Joey and Amy. It, I was lost in this whole thing. Wow. You really did it when you were 12. Just eight months after Mary Jo was shot in the head, ABC, CBS, and NBC each released their own made-for-TV movie. You ever been with an older guy? Unstoppable. Whatever Amy wants, Amy gets. Insatiable. All right. Come on. Give me a smile. Come on. In the CBS version, which was our version, of course Joey didn't have an affair. It was, he was just a nice guy who knew her. The dopey wife believed everything he said because he told me he had nothing to do with her. He swore to me on our children's lives. And I believed him. While the CBS movie helps pay for some of Mary Jo's legal bills, mostly it brings more unwanted media attention. Mary Jo begins to feel like nothing can cut up interest in her story. But she's wrong. I sprung up in a silent screen and holding myself and I couldn't stop bleeding. And that's when John Bobbitt discovered his penis had been severed. By the summer of 1993, A Current Affair and other tabloid shows have turned the Butterfucos into international celebrities. But it's becoming obvious that Joey is enjoying the limelight more than Mary Jo. He's definitely a celebrity. He's a character and a celebrity. Joey is liking all this attention. I'm not understanding this, but I'm too ill and just trying to get through each day. He's my half-brother. <laughs> and when I would say to him, stop talking to them, shut up! You know, I'd be like, what? I'd get the, they've done this to us, Mary Jo. They did this. So I'm going to do everything I can. We're going to monetize on this. I'm just giving them what they want. Surely the Guinness Book of Records one day will list the name Badafuka. But then a new story temporarily severs the tabloid's fascination with Joey Badafuka. The four-year marriage of John and his South American wife, Lorena, was rocky to say the least. I sprung up in a silent scream and holding myself and I couldn't stop bleeding. Lorena Bobbitt cut off her husband's penis while he slept. On January 23rd, 1993, John and Lorena Bobbitt make headlines after Lorena amputates part of his genitals in retaliation for years of alleged rape and abuse. I think the first story to be on air that really made me raise my eyebrows was John Wayne Bobbitt, a man who had his manhood cut off. That's when I realized Nothing was off limits. The organ was miraculously reattached, and ever since, John has become a cottage industry of T-shirts, movie deals, and media appearances. Bobbitt turned his infamy into profit, making TV appearances and acting in pornographic films. The Bobbitts get paid for exclusive interviews to the tabloid news shows, which are now paying out big money to anyone with a story they hope will boost their ratings. I want to tell people exactly what happened. You know, I'm not the bad guy. I didn't rape my wife, I didn't beat my wife. My bosses, that's all they cared about, was ratings. There's nothing bigger than ratings, especially in the world of tabloid television. Exclusives with the Bobbitts give Inside Edition a boost in their numbers. Just how turbulent it was. But finding stories that will deliver blockbuster ratings night after night, five nights a week, becomes an increasingly difficult task. Alan Masters was a big shot in Willow Springs, a town where men ruled everything. The self-confessed nymphomaniac charged with prostitution. When a current affairs ratings hit an all-time low, they decide to return to a story that always worked, the Long Island Lolita. Just when you thought you'd heard the last from Amy Fisher and Joe Buttafuoco, the latest bombshell in the case against the alleged lover of the Long Island Lolita, Joey and the jury. Joey Buttafuoco is back in the news when he gets charged with the statutory rape of Amy Fisher. 
The media had gotten so crazy with us that there became a demand for Joey to be held accountable for what happened. Peter and I were working back at a current affair. We had taken over a current affair, working with Steve Dunleavy again. We were brought in because Rupert Murdoch knew that we needed to do something to get the ratings back up for a current affair. And the only way to do that was to infuse a lot of money. So we paid $500,000 for an interview in which Joey would finally admit on camera to his wife that he had had an affair with Amy Fisher and Mary Jo would say, I know, I forgive you. But there's only one problem with their plan. Despite agreeing to plead guilty to the rape charges, Joey's still telling Mary Jo that he never had sex with Amy Fisher. He claims he only plea bargained to spare the family a trial. You won't come to terms with the fact that he did have an affair. Says who? And at this point, Mary Jo still believes him. Shortly before the interview began, Joey Buttafuoco admitted that he had never actually let his wife know that he did have an affair with Amy Fisher. He still had been denying it to her. The Fox attorneys got on with, with Mary Jo and Joey's attorneys and said, look, this is $500,000. Uh, you've got to say this. So we reconvened at Steve Dunleavy's house and redid the interview. As I recall, he's going to say I have the affair and I'm going to say and I forgive you. That was the stipulation. Again, I didn't believe it. I still didn't believe it, but I, I had to say it. A lot of women with bullets in the head wouldn't forgive Joey Badafuka. But what's your reaction? I love him. I forgive him. He's my husband. With those nine words, the Badafukos collect the 500,000. At the time, it's the highest payout by a tabloid show and a new low for checkbook journalism. It wasn't easy, but I, I did it. I did it. I sold out. I sold out. Hoping they'd all go away, and they didn't. <laughs> for the crime of rape in the third degree, you had to serve six months in a county jail as conditions of and concurrent with a five-year probationary term. Within minutes of being sentenced, Joey Badafuka was a prisoner at the Nassau County Jail. Even after both Amy Fisher and Joey get sent to prison, the Badafukos remain in the spotlight, not just on tabloid shows, but also as punchlines on late night comedy shows. Mary Jo, I see you have a hell of a bald spot there. It, it must have been some accident. Oh yeah, when I tell you a crazy teenage bitch tried to kill me. <laughs> When I would see myself portrayed on SNL or in Living Color, it bothered me because I was a victim of a violent crime. It wasn't funny. They made fun of my face. Well, my face looks like that because I got shot. It bothered the hell out of me for a long time because it's what they did. It was, we were ripe for anything, any parody, any joke. Hey, Joey, what are you kissing that whore for? Hey, Mary Jo, I wasn't kissing her. I was uh, giving a CPR over here. The media's appetite for the Buttafuoco Fisher debacle is insatiable until. Yeah, well, I am. Uh... O.J. Simpson and the crime of the century. This it just culminates a series of uh, unbelievable events that took place today. When the O.J. Simpson story happened, I remember saying to Joey, we're free. We're free. They're done with us. From the L.A. County Courthouse, the site of the trial of the century, good evening. I'm Barry Nolan. The O.J. Simpson trial was probably the craziest media event I've ever seen in my lifetime, and I don't think I'll ever see anything like it again. O.J. Simpson is wanted, but he's been charged in the two murders that took place Sunday night. Heading into 1994, tabloid television was out of control. Everything was leading up to what happened when Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were slaughtered. In the summer of 1994, the manhunt for the former running back and Hertz rental car pitchman, O.J. Simpson, mesmerizes the nation. Prosecutors said O.J. had the motive. They painted him as a jealous wife abuser. 
Once the trial gets underway, 150 million viewers watch the trial like a daily soap opera, turning the judge, attorneys, and witnesses into many celebrities. The nation was absolutely gripped by that story. They could not get enough of it. Experts put the former football star's voice to the test. It's called a psychological stress evaluator, and it analyzes a person. It's a classic tabloid story. It has everything in it. It has murder, it has sex, it has celebrity. It also has the power to obliterate the line between network and tabloid news, with the tabloid shows regularly outreporting the mainstream press. Secret bank account. Hard copy gets to the bottom line about how much money OJ really has. The networks saw that we were out scooping them on everything OJ, and that viewers were watching Current Affair, Hard Copy, and Inside Edition instead of their nightly news programs. After a decade looking down their noses at the tabloid news, another amazing day in Los Angeles. Mainstream networks start looking a lot like the thing they once despised and criticized. NBC News and other media reported that Kalen told law enforcement that Simpson was not at home when a limo arrived to take him to the airport. I really think the momentum shifted during the O.J. Simpson trial. I see it as the time where the network said, we can't beat him, we got to join him. And that's what they did. Good evening. Tanya Horning is still insisting she was never in on the plan to attack Nancy Kerrigan. But for the first time today, Harding admitted she did not go to the authorities immediately. For Mary Jo Buttafuoco, the media's fascination with O.J. gives her enough time away from the spotlight to get her life together. In 2003, she finally divorces Joey. Joey never, ever, ever, ever to this day said, Mary Jo, I did something really horrible and really wrong and I'm so sorry. Because he continued on with his crazy life. Both Joey and Amy continue to bask in the limelight a little bit longer. For Joey, it stints on Judge Judy and celebrity boxing. For Amy Fisher, it's a string of more sex tapes. But by the end of the decade, the tabloid TV shows that made them famous are essentially dead. The tabloid shows kind of lost their, their, their relevance. The networks took over. They started covering stories like O.J. Simpson. They started covering the stories they wouldn't have touched. Current Affair was canceled. Hard Copy was canceled by the, by the end of, of the decade. Even the host of the last show standing, Inside Edition, seems to be feeling the strain. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. And we will leave you with a, I, I can't do it. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Do it live. In 2019, Steve Dunleavy, the man who best epitomizes tabloid journalism in the 90s, dies at the age of 81. But the legacy of what he helped create lives on. I think you can find any sort of form of tabloid you want on the internet whether it be TMZ for your gossip, TikTok for some piece of video that everybody wants to see. Police are still searching for 22-year-old Gabby Petito. She disappeared while on a cross-country road trip. You can get whatever you want, and that's where tabloid is. We thought with the current affair that we were democratizing news telling. Only certain people were allowed to, to tell the news in the early 90s. But once the internet came along, look at where we are now. The word tabloid really doesn't even matter anymore. Let me interrupt you. Congresswoman, let me interrupt you just for a moment. We've got some breaking news out of Miami. Stand by, if you will. Justin Bieber has been arrested on a number of charges. Everything is tabloid today. 